Dear Bruce, ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, a particular pleasure and honor for me today, a difficult day, a difficult week. Uh, we're planning on having this function uh, with uh, more people and uh, with more glamour, but because uh, of the mourning that we observe in, uh, in the country, uh, I discussed it uh, with Bruce and uh, we decided to, to go on with the, with the event, with the function, but uh, we wanted to, to keep it uh, in a lower profile, in a lower key. Uh, it, as I said, it's uh, a particular moment for me. I mean, uh, some months ago, one day I received the book. I opened the envelope and it was uh, a book about uh, Athens and uh, I, it was sent to me by uh, Bruce Clark. I knew Bruce Clark, I had read uh, about him, I read uh, of him, but uh, I thought that it was a new book. I was very busy those days and uh, I didn't open uh, the book, I didn't read the book, I left it on this table. <laughs> it was the time that uh, we had a um, high-ranking uh, delegation from Greece and the head of the delegation, he was sitting uh, there, we were receiving uh, uh, British politicians uh, and dignitaries and uh, we negotiated a few different things. And between uh, uh, appointments, he said to me, where did you find this book? I know Bruce, he's uh, very important for Greece. Uh, we have, uh, he has written a lot about Greece. Uh, he's a particular person. And uh, I said, you can have the book if you want. <laughs> <laughs> he opened the book and uh, he realized it was dedicated to me. <laughs> he said, no, I wouldn't take it. <laughs> the person was the Prime Minister, Mr. Mitsotakis. <laughs> <laughs> so, what I did, I called uh, Bruce, I said, it's, uh, I am uh, so and so, and I had an accident a few days ago. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the book, I didn't read the book, but somebody else read the book. So, do you mind, send me uh, a copy uh, to to give it to the Prime Minister. And uh, we discussed a little bit and we decided to have two, two copies and I gave the other one to the person that is responsible for the city of Athens, the mayor of the city of Athens, Mr. Bakoyanis. So they both received um, the, the book, they read it before me and they were making comments to me about uh, the book and I'm very happy that today we all are here to honor uh, Bruce. Bruce, uh, I'm not going to say uh, much about uh, Bruce uh, because uh, you know him longer than me, you know him uh, better than me. But uh, he's somebody that represents um, uh, a very important figure uh, for Greece in uh, this country. Bruce, he spent um, uh, a lot of time since his youth in Greece. He speaks Greek, to my, to my surprise, uh, very good Greek, and uh, he even uh, uses some uh, words that uh, modern Greeks understand. He's a scholar of the, of the Greek language. And uh, but, uh, what I find uh, fascinating about uh, Bruce is that he, he believes uh, from the deep of his heart, as he told me, uh, on a topic that is very important for us, the return of the Parthenon uh, sculptures. And uh, he's an advocate, uh, he writes articles about that, and whenever we ask his opinion what to do, how to do uh, about the sculptures, he's, uh, he's there, uh, supportive. And last but not least, uh, um, he was honored, it's a very great honor for, for everybody,
to be honored by the uh, Orthodox uh, Church, uh, Your Eminence, uh, uh, you told me first, and Bruce uh, uh, confirmed it, that back in uh, about uh, four years ago, 2018, uh, Bruce was uh, became archon of the Greek Orthodox Church of the Patriarchate in uh, Constantinople. His archon uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, Archon uh, translator, and that's another honor, another particular honor. Uh, having all this in mind, uh, I spoke with the the office of the president of the republic, and I said uh, I would like to propose that. Uh, as uh, an expression of gratitude and recognition to, to Bruce, our country, that we don't do that uh, very often. We have uh, to honor his uh, services to, to the country and uh, give him, decorate, uh, decorate him. As soon as the, the idea went to the President of the Republic, uh, the, the response was uh, positive. That's uh, why we're here tonight. Bruce, I have uh, the, the great honor to present to you the gold uh, cross of the Order of the Phoenix. It's not easy. Yeah. I will leave it like that and okay. it will be fixed after. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the proof for it uh, really? with the signature <laughs> of the President of the Republic, uh, yes, the yes, Foreign yes, Minister. Yes, yes. Oh, that's marvelous. Yes, yes. A wonderful touch. Yes, yes, yes. Well, absolutely. <laughs> Just, not just the Order of the Phoenix, but the Golden Cross of the Order of the Phoenix. This is yeah, really that's <laughs> the profoundest honor, I must say. I'm, really, I'm deeply moved. I must say. What my heart ever. So thanks for your efforts to make this very special day come about, and indeed still come about in the face of adversity. Um, your Excellency, Your Eminence, Lords, Ladies and Gentlemen, um, I will allow myself to respond to this extraordinary honor with just a few personal reminiscences. The year of our Lord, 1970, was a very important one for an 11-year-old boy called Bruce Clark. One freezing day in February, my younger brother and I were summoned to the office of the headmaster of our boarding school in Dublin. Now, such a summons did not usually portend good news, <laughs> uh, but on this particular occasion, we received some thrilling information. We were told that our father, Wallace Clark, was about to be decorated at Buckingham Palace and that he had obtained some tickets and he wished us to be there. So the next 24 hours was a stream of exciting events. And soon we were sitting in the throne room, we were listening to the band play, we were watching one recipient after another step forward and receive an honour from Her Late Majesty. And thus Wallace Clark became an ordinary member of the Order of the British Empire, an honour which had been conferred on his father and his grandfather. Not the highest award in the Sovereign's gift, but nonetheless a very appropriate and respectable recognition of his public services in the particular corner of Northern Ireland that we come from. Now, it seems very unlikely, vanishingly unlikely, <laughs> that I will ever follow my foremost <laughs> down that particular red carpet. But on the other hand, uh, none of them would ever have imagined uh, that I would be honored for a contribution uh, to the culture and history of Greece. And that touches me really to the bottom of my heart. For fear of conceit or false modesty, I will refrain from saying anything about my worthiness to receive such an honor, <laughs> that the Queen on Ali, as you would say in Greek, other people will judge that. But what I can willingly confirm is that engagement with Greece, with Greek culture, 
has been uh, a lifelong story, a lifelong story of love. It has been going on at least for 50 years. So let me return to that fateful year of childhood. That summer, 1970, my father brought his family by ferry and car from Ireland to Greece. I was already learning ancient Greek and I was dabbling in modern Greek. So the chance of uh, practicing some Greek uh, epitopo, you know, in, in the actual country, was every bit as exciting as going to Buckingham Palace. Minutes after uh, driving off the ferry in Patras, I managed to make my first mistake. <laughs> Entering a bakery in search of two loaves of bread, uh, I solemnly asked for Dio Psomia. The baker smiled at me and said, Dio Psomia. Uh, and from that moment on, I'd been making mistakes in Greek and learning from them. And I would very much like to think that that process is still continuing. Uh, to give you an idea, I have just translated a short story by Pap Diamandis, and I can assure you that my first draft contained many mistakes, but I shared it with a better Greek scholar than me, and between us we worked out what the great short story writer was trying to say, and I hope the net result does more or less convey the meaning accurately. So this process of learning from mistakes has been a long one. Uh, let me now continue about my childhood exposure to Greece. Uh, two years later, uh, we had a sailing trip in a sturdy old wooden boat around the Cyclades. Now, the high point of that trip was landing on Delos, an island of monuments, mosaics, and mystery. Just six of us, my parents, my brother, myself, and two friends of my parents. It so happens that I went back to Delos on an assignment for The Economist, in 2019, and that was my first return after the initial childhood visit. And I had during that first return an extraordinary personal revelation. I had the sense that for all six of us who walked around the monuments of Delos, it had been a transformative experience. But for each of us in a very different way, it was as though we had all been sucked into a vortex and then cast out in different directions. For my father, visiting Delos was a stimulus to his lyrical writing about the Irish islands, which he accomplished a few years later. For me, uh, the visit to Delos was a, a start, if you like, in a voyage through the waters of Hellenism, a voyage that I made ultimately alone. Now, in my book, Twice a Stranger, you may have noticed, it's dedicated to my parents who took me to the shores of the Aegean. Now, I can't say that I thought deeply about their de delegation. It was just an act of family duty, if you like. But on that return visit to Delos, I suddenly understood that what I had written was, in the most literal sense, true. My parents took me to the shores of the Aegean, but thereafter uh, I was destined to sail on alone uh, on a voyage uh, on which they could not accompany me, and whose final destination was absolutely impossible to predict. At this moment in history, when much grander issues of succession and generational change are on people's minds, it seems worthwhile to recall a banal, perhaps, but important truth about human life. Our guardians, our mentors, who may or may not be our blood parents, do take us to the water's edge and that's a reason to be very grateful. But then we have to make a voyage alone. They cannot predict the destination, they cannot guide the destination, and we shouldn't expect them to. People asking me now whether I have gained, after 50 years, any new insights into the history of Hellenism as a result of writing my latest book, which is called Athens, City of Wisdom. Before I answer that question, I'd like to digress for a moment and welcome some old and new friends to this room. When I lived in Greece for six months as a 17-year-old, as a penniless 17-year-old, my closest friend was a medical student from Ethiopia. At that time, uh, Greece was giving a lot of scholarships to Ethiopia because of the common Eastern <coughs> Eastern lakes. Uh, and I formed a close bond with an Ethiopian student called Thomas Bellet. And I remember vividly how he and his beautiful Greek girlfriend used to have debates long into the night 
about the finer points of the dictatorship of the proletariat. <laughs> also joining us tonight is a person from another holy island, um, even holier than Delos perhaps, the island of Patmos. Now Patmos, as you know, has been ground zero for a global environmental spiritual movement. And that is thanks to two patriarchs, uh, Patriarch Dimitrios and subsequently Patriarch Bartholomeos. Now, with us tonight is a friend called Jean Knights, who is translating some of that lofty environmental spiritual theory into practice by running a charity on the island uh, called Caris, which aims to restore the biodiversity, um, the water table, traditional farming methods. In other words, uh, is aiming to restore the ecosystem of the island itself. And there's, there's wisdom there, because it's all very well proclaiming great environmental spiritual messages in a particular island, but uh, it has to start at home somehow, that wisdom. And thanks to Jean, uh, so, but some very good and practical work is being done. As a result of that extraordinary environmental spiritual initiative, which began on Patmos, uh, first with Patriarch Dimitrios in 1988, and then Patriarch Bartholomeus in 1995, 1995 um, I was myself propelled to some extraordinary and unlikely parts of the world, um, including Brazil and Greenland and New Orleans, um, attending and participating actively in symposia organized by His Royal Holiness. So it's a special treat to have with me people who, in one fashion or another, were uh, helpers or companions on those extraordinary voyages. For example, Nicky Marves, Catherine Mitilineo, uh, Father Alexander Fosteropoulos, all of you in different ways uh, helped to make those extraordinary voyages, which were among the most extraordinary events of my life, actually take place. Returning to my new book, Athens, City of Wisdom, what I think I learned was that Hellenism has always flourished in creative interaction with other civilizations. Yes, Hellenism usually had a geographical hub, and for quite a lot of history, that hub was Athens. Not all periods. Long before Athens flourished, one could say that the hub of Hellenism was Crete, your native island, Kostas, and also your native island, I think. Um, so it hasn't always been Athens, but it was Athens for quite a lot of the time. At the same time, Hellenism as a cultural phenomenon has perpetually shifting boundaries, and it has fused with other countries in extraordinary ways. I owe to my young friend Yamir Bade the following extraordinary insight. In the Indo-Greek kingdoms, which flourished 2,200 years ago on the northwestern side of the subcontinent, Hellenism was a liberating force, at least in relation to Indian Brahmin culture, which reserved high culture for a small elite. As Yamir has shown, those Indo-Greek realms were open not only to the Hellenistic world, but also to Persian culture, and as he has argued, you can sense that openness, that freedom, uh, both in the Gandhara sculptures and also in snatches of poetry that were written by Indians, but Indians who were extremely well versed, as Yamir is, in Greek literature. But the question always is, on what terms does Hellenism interact with other cultures? In the 18th century, uh, the elite, the powerful people of Northern Europe, developed a kind of obsession with Hellenism. They longed, in some sense or other, to capture that civilization for themselves. At first, they made meticulous drawings of ancient monuments in the hope that those perfect, those perfect proportions could be copied in their own countries and confer on their own chilly streets some of that Hellenic majesty and stardust, if you like. But unfortunately, from capturing the Greek genius through drawings and mouldings to physically grabbing the products of that genius turned out to be rather a small step. In the year of 1788, a young French antiquarian received the instruction from his, from his aristocratic boss that he must extract everything he could from the soil of the Acropolis and take it away. Fouillé, fouillé, fouillé. From that moment on, there was an unseemly Anglo-French race in progress to remove and ship northwards as much as possible of the physical patrimony of Hellenism. Into this feverish contest, 
there stepped a brilliant, quixotic, perhaps rather arrogant personality of noble Anglo-Scots lineage, a product of Harrow School. Now, I refer not to Lord E, but Lord B, in this case. Um, uh, I refer to Lord Byron, of course. Um, now, it so happens we're joined tonight by Ioannis Kundis, who is a scholar of Byron and his era. That's another person to welcome warmly. Arriving in the winter of 1810, 1811, in the Ottoman town of Athens, Byron sensed an immediate connection with the world of Socrates and Plato, an immediate distaste for a certain school of antiquarianism, what he called antiquarian twaddle, uh, which thought that objects and styles could simply be transferred uh, northwards, um, completely detached from their original environment, um, with no uh, loss of integrity of those objects and, and styles. We probably all know uh, the most famous lines of Byron about Greece. Uh, they reflect his intoxication with the beauty of Attica, with the mountains, with the seas. Um, uh, the mountains look on Marathon, Marathon looks on the sea, and there I dreamt an hour alone that Greece might still be free. The question is, free to do what exactly? Free to do what? Well, I would say free to press on with the task of perpetually defining, redefining Hellenism, which will never be an easy task, uh, not under the diktat of others, but in creative, uh, unforced, free collaboration and synergy with other cultures. And as long as that collaboration is free and unforced, then I think uh, the results will be rich and wonderful and surprising. It, what, I think what Byron sensed is that the process of defining what it means to be Greek, which is a, a question perpetually open, uh, it has to be undertaken by people, among others, among others, by people who in some sense or other themselves identify as Greek, who are prepared to take the risks of being Greek. Now, Greekness can mean, you know, by virtue of, of a birth or family origin, or simply, as, you know, as Socrates said, 2,300 years ago by virtue of education and culture and choice. Uh, there are many ways of being Greek. But in some sense or other, the task of defining Greekness, always in rich dialogue with others, uh, has to be undertaken by those who are prepared to take the risk, so to speak, of entering the vortex without having the slightest idea of uh, where they will emerge from that vortex. And I think that was very well understood by many of the great Anglophone Philhellenes of the 20th century. Peter Levi, Kevin Andrews, Louis McNeese, Philip Sherrard, Olivia Manning, Rose McCauley, Marianne Pascoe, Alison France, Joan Connolly, Sofka Zinoviev. And equally well by great Irish writers about Greece, people like uh, Seamus Heaney, Theo Dorgan, who wrote in a mixture of English and Irish about that country. Anybody who purports to understand Greece or to contribute to the Greek process of self-understanding has to be willing to enter the vortex without knowing what the final destination will be. Fifty years after walking into that Peloponnesian bakery, I still have not the slightest idea what my final destination will be, and I feel in no hurry to find out. <laughs> what I am conscious of is that my companions on that search uh, become more and more numerous, some have been lost to another world, but new ones are joining all the time, uh, and it's a, sort, a search that has defined my life and uh, continues to give me great joy. Now, as, 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 as a final offering for this evening, I thought I should read a snatch of poetry, uh, of, of modern Greek poetry. Um, it's a piece of poetry about the Greek language, about the long durée of the Greek language. Some of you will know it, some of you won't. I will read it in Greek, and then I will make my own free translation, um, and that will be my way of expressing my thanks to the ambassador, and to the government of Greece, and to all of you. It's by Odysseus Elitis, and it's part of the Action Este. Tinglosa muedosan eliniki, to spiti phtokiko stisambodiestu omiru, monaki egnia iglosamu stisambodiestu omiru. Ekis pari ke perkes, animoda ta rimata, remata prasina mesta galazia, osa idas ta splankne monanagone, 
στην Ουγγάρια, μέδουζε με τα πρώτα λόγια των Σιρήνων, όστρακα ρόδινα με τα πρώτα μαύρα ρίγη. Μονάχη έγνοια η γλώσσα μου με τα πρώτα μαύρα ρίγη. Now let me translate, I will translate freely and in my own translation, but I hope you will somehow convey uh, without mistakes, without too many mistakes, what I think uh, Elidus was trying to say. The language they gave me was Greek, a humble dwelling on the sands of Homer. My only care, my language on the sands of Homer. There you can see sea bream and perch. You can see wind-beaten verbs green currents gushing up through the blue ones, all the things I observed coming up in my loins, sponges, jellyfish, along with the first words of the sirens, rosy-coloured oysters with those primal black shudders, my only concern, my language, with those primal black shudders. Invite uh, the Archbishop uh, Nikitas to say a few words, given the the connection Bruce uh, has with the patriarchate, with the, the religion. Please, uh, Your mm. Good evening to all. I'll be very short and brief. I'll use an ecclesiastical word, axios, axios. and he is indeed worthy not only of the award and the grace that comes with it, but you are also worthy and noble as a Hellene, because to be a Hellene is something that we can embrace. As you noted, it's not only by birth. I often say it's how we live and the spirit by which we live. And you embrace the true spirit of Hellenism those noble ideals and the values, and I pray that God will continue to bless you. So you will not only write and speak about the glory that was Greece and is Greece, but also the truths, the values, the principles of the patriarchate, of the Orthodox world, and the values which each of us try to live, and I commend and congratulate the ambassador for his initiatives and for all that he does to promote Hellenic ideals and values in this city and in this land. I would say also my co-worker as we blend in a very good way church and state or state and church. Separate identities but sharing many of the same values and ideals including that of language and heritage and, of course, the principles that the Church and our history have given us. Again, congratulations from His All Holiness, Axios, and I look forward to having you here when the Patriarch is here in October. Yes, yes, yes.